I was a ketamine addict for probably around about 10, 11 years. And um, for me, that had dreadful effects. I nearly lost my bladder, um, my kidneys, my liver almost packed in. I lost half my body weight at the time, which I went down to around about six stone. Um, but to be honest, it, that wasn't ketamine's fault, that was my fault. My name is Thomas Delaney, I'm a public speaker, I'm also a student and I'm also a recovering drug addict and I'm here today to answer the audience questions regarding drug abuse, all the taboo and scary questions that we have but probably don't um, have the courage to ask in public. Okay, so the first question, what was the first hit like or what was that first hit like? So I remember very well my first um, encounter with cocaine. So a bunch of friends that I'll not mention <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, they were all a bit older than me, all deemed as really cool, confident guys. Um, and I, had, I was really naive, never tried drugs, never even seen cocaine at this point apart from like on telly or whatever. And I had no idea how to take it. I had no idea how much to take. I genuinely thought I was gonna die. I was really scared and all weird about it. And um, my friend put a straw in a bag and said, like, you know, just put your nose over it and have a, you know, have a little sniff. Um, and that's how you do it. Um, so the first time I tried it, I actually, rather than snorting in, I, I, I blew out through my nose and blew cocaine <laughs> everywhere, which off my friends. Um, so they let me have another go um, and they put the straw back in the bag, in another bag. And um, I probably snorted about half a gram <laughs> in one go. Um, and I instantly felt this like shock all the way like from my head to the bottom of my spine and instantly I felt like I was more um I felt like I was more present I felt like I was more aware of time my environment the space that I was in um as well as feeling this euphoric rush of being like loved up with everything and anyone and I, you know, I felt really good about myself, which is the first time in a long time that I actually felt like that. And um, you know, and that leads to where you are starting cooking before you go to work, um, because you need it because you've been up for weeks on end. But weirdly enough, I think when you're young, you're quite naive and you glamorise those sort of stupid moments. Um, you know, you all think it's cool being dragged out of a nightclub, and you know, it's funny and it's a laugh. Um, but the, you know, the reality is that it's not, um, and it should definitely be seen as a huge, you know, a huge cause for concern. What was the most you spent on drugs in a day? God. Um, so weirdly enough, um, I, used to, I grew up in London, and I used to live in London during my sort of late teens, early 20s, and one of my friends, who is actually still a very good friend of mine today, um, he came down to visit me and I think over the course of the weekend we went out and at this point I didn't take ketamine. Um, my addiction was cocaine and um, between us we probably spent around about seven grand over the course of a weekend, possibly £8,000. That was on a Friday and Saturday, sort of filtering on in into the Sunday. Um, so in a day, um, not too sure, but over the course of a week, I'm nearly £10,000 between two of us, so it's quite a lot. Um, and I've probably spent way, 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 way more in my life. <laughs> what is a K-hole? Um, so I can answer this really easily. Uh, so K a K-hole, is what people call it, is, a, is when you take too much ketamine and you sort of trip out into, a, into another place in the universe. Um, it's also probably where you're most vulnerable to an attack or to any sort of any abuse that you may have at a party or you may experience a kettle is, is something that a lot of, I think, users try and seek to gain whatever pleasure it is that they gain from it. Um, but it's also an incredibly dangerous um, position or point in your life to be in. And also I've been in um, thousands of kettles um, and I never enjoyed any single one of them. What was the most you used in a day? Um, so the worst I was, the worst I can recall of using it a day was, was ironically the last 24 hours um, before I went into rehab um, and I sniffed a total of 36 grams of ketamine uh, within a 24 hour period. And there's probably people watching that would think he's chatting absolutely.
um, but that is the God's honest truth. Um, but that was at the height of my addiction where I was snorting um, anything upwards of an ounce a day uh, from morning till night until I passed out, um, which is also why I weighed six stone and was nearly dead. So why did you take Ket in the first place? Um, well, I had a very traumatic childhood. I went through things that um, you wouldn't wish upon your worst enemy. I saw a lot of domestic violence, abuse, a lot of things that would um, that made me have a lot of insecurities and feel really about myself. Um, and for me, although I'd taken cocaine and I took acid for a, you know, I tried pills and all these other sorts of drugs. Uh, for me, ketamine just made my brain go numb. It shut out all the negative voices in my head or for a period of time anyway. And um, for me, it just helped get through the day, which I know sounds quite cheesy, um, but it did. And for me, you know, I was, I was scared to take ketamine the first time I tried it and I never really felt it because I mixed it with cocaine. And then once I tried it on its own, um, I instantly fell in love with that feeling of just not caring about anything or arguing with myself in my head constantly. Um, there's a lot of theories on what causes addiction, um, whether it's lifestyle habits, whether it's your environment, whether it's your attitudes or, or lots of, there's lots of different factors that makes up um, someone's decision to choose drugs. But ultimately I think what underlines it is pain, um, is trauma, is ACEs, adverse childhood experiences for those that don't know the acronym. Um, but for me, it's, it's all about trauma. To me, addiction is the answer to solve all of your problems, um, or it was for a very long period of my life. Which drug has the worst effect on you? Um, I was a ketamine addict for probably around about 10, 11 years. And um, for me, that had dreadful effects. I nearly lost my bladder. Um, my kidneys and my liver almost packed in. I lost half my body weight at the time, which I went down to around about six stone. Um, but to be honest, it, that wasn't ketamine's fault. That was my fault. And also, you know, that drug quite easily could have been alcohol or crack or cocaine or, or smack. It could have been any other drug. Um, but for me, it was, you know, my, my choice was, was to choose um, ketamine, which has profound effects. Um, and a lot of them are quite embarrassing. So for example, like I would pass your, when I, when I would go to the toilet, I would pass chunks of, which I later found out was chunks of the lining of my bladder, which sounds absolutely disgusting. So if you're eating whilst watching this, I apologize. Um, but I used to blood chunks, I used to pass out. Um, the thing with ketamine is your bladder naturally expands and contracts to control the, the flow of urine when you go to the toilet from your bladder. Um, but what ketamine does is it actually sticks to the lining of your bladder. It scars it. So what it does is then it prevents your bladder from expanding and contracting. And it also, what it does is it damages the nerve endings, which constantly sends the signal to your brain that you need the toilet. So if you speak to any ketamine addict, for example, one of the things that they won't talk about in public, but they'll all probably slightly talk about to each other is the fact that you have severe, severe problems um, downstairs going to the toilet passing urine is unbelievably painful um, and you don't pee like how you should pee. You pee little drops and that might take you an hour and you are screaming on the floor in all of yourself. Um, it is disgusting. But I've got friends that are my age in the 30s, even maybe 40s, that, um, that even need to wear a bag or more embarrassingly, um, wear nappies. You can imagine being 36 years old um, into a nappy, um, and I'm not saying that to you know to, to make you know to make a joke of people that do that, but that's how serious it is. Um, if you continue to use ketamine, it will it will destroy your body, um, and that not that's not to mention the mental effects. You know, what is the closest you came to dying? And I, I remember being in hospital only a few weeks before I went into rehab, and I was telling the doctor, you know, I've got issues, you know, I can't stop taking drugs, blah blah blah. Um, and he said, regardless of the drugs, if you don't eat, you are going to die um, because you are malnourished. Your body is physically shutting down. Towards the end of my addiction, you know, I lost so much weight. I was so ill. Um, I was so depressed and just mentally, physically, spiritually and mentally. Um, and I was quite happy to die as well, which is, which is the frightening thing in it all. Um, 
I actually thought that death would be the final thing that that would release the pain and suffering. But thankfully, you know, that didn't happen. Um, I managed to sort it out, so I was lucky in that aspect. But yeah, that was definitely the closest that I came came to death and <laughs> I'll never go back there. So the next question is, should all drugs be legalized? So I've had this conversation loads of times before. There is countries such as Portugal where would be a great example of where the, the government legalized drugs. What that doesn't mean is that you could walk to your local Marks and Spencers and buy cocaine or crack or ketamine or any other drug that you want. What it did do was it legalized, um, so Portugal, for example, what they did was they legalized the possession of drugs. So if you got caught with a certain amount, rather than being punished and going through sort of the judicial system um, and going to prison or getting a criminal record, which would be held against you and also add further stigma and um, discrimination, I guess, to the person, what they did was they legalized it. So if you did get caught with drugs, with possession, um, unless obviously it was a huge, vast amount where you were obviously dealing drugs, you would um, be offered support and help, um, which is an amazing idea. Um, so in that respect, yes, it should be. Our drug laws are well outdated as well. Um, and I live in Scotland, where the drug laws are actually governed by Westminster and not Scotland itself, which causes an array of massive problems as well, considering that Glasgow in particular, where I live, is the drug capital of Europe. So it's, it's difficult to tackle drug problems when you're governed by another country, um, in this case, Scotland. So what's rehab like? Um, so I can, I can tell you from first-hand experience, I went to rehab on the 2nd of November, 2018, and never looked back really, but um, rehab is hard. Um, everyone's crazy in a nice way. Um, and there's a lot of people that have got severe issues. There's a lot of people with a lot of trust issues, with commitment issues, with how they fit into society and how they even fit in or feel within themselves. Um, Rehab is hard, you know, I, I never went to a posh fancy rehab. Um, sorry if anyone from the rehab that, <laughs> that works for the rehab that I went to. It's an amazing facility. Um, I went to a place called Phoenix Futures in, in Glasgow, in Scotland. Um, it was incredibly challenging, it was difficult. Some days I wanted to kill myself, like not literally, but like it was so difficult that um, it was hard to cope in there sometimes. But the staff were amazing, um, well, certain members of staff anyway. Um, it, it's hard, um, I'm not gonna lie. Rehab shouldn't be seen as a holiday resort. It's not somewhere you go and practice yoga for six months and, and hug trees and come out and everything's gonna be off, you know, okay. You can do those things. Um, I don't agree with medicine being used. And also I think I was the only person that the rehab that I went to ever heard of refusing to detox. So when I went to rehab, um, I refused all the other drugs that they were gonna give me to come off of ketamine. So, um, there's, there's a ton of pharmaceutical drugs that they can give you to detox. And I was the only person that the doctor had ever heard in her 40 years of practice that refused to detox. So I went cold turkey. Um, in my experience, it's about stopping, taking a step back, looking at what needs to be fixed in, in your own self and your soul. Um, and that doesn't make me better. It doesn't make me different. Um, it's just me. That's what I wanted to do. Um, that's because that's what I believe was best for me. So what's the worst? <laughs> what's the worst part about being clean? Um, God. Uh, so I would say the worst part is, but it's also the. It's the worst part, but in hindsight, also one of the best parts, is the fact that rather than running away from my problems, I tackle them head on, um, which can be very difficult at times. Very very difficult um, in some cases. But rather than running away from my problems and going and using drugs to deal with them all, I'd rather tackle the, the problem holistically or at least have a method of approaching a certain thing that I need to resolve and get it resolved. And, you know, it takes a lot of confidence. It takes a lot of resilience to do things like that. Um, I think one of the, also the one thing that just came to my mind, one of the worst parts about being clean is the fact that when you are clean and sober, you realise how up the rest of the world is um, and how sorry am I allowed to swear of course um, but yeah you, you realise you know how f***ed up society is um, you know I'm not perfect I'm not a saint you know I'm not um, walking around like Jesus Christ and I'm the purest soul on the planet you know I'm, I'm flawed like every other human being but 
um, I think when you're clean and sober, you realise how much society depends on substances to avoid life. Um, and that's quite a daunting thought to have. Um, so yeah, those things are the worst. So what was the worst thing you did on drugs? This is a dreaded question. Um, because there's, there's loads of things that I did. Um, I stole money. Um, I borrowed money from people with all intentions of paying them back and, and probably never did for years. Um, I would use drugs in front of, not directly in front of my family, um, but I would, you know, I'd say I'm going to the toilet, which wasn't a, an unusual thing. Um, and I'd been there for half an hour racking lines up. Um, you know, and then I'd come out in a sort of, not quite a cat all state, but also not really on this planet either. Um, and lie about it. You know, I've got I've got a beautiful family and you know, I've got like a I've got a son now which thankfully he'll never ever ever see that person, but my nephew has. Um my two nieces, fortunately they weren't born then either. They've been born during um during the time I, I managed to get into recovery and, and, and now. Um but my nephew did, you know, and I, and I feel you know, I feel awful for that. Um I feel awful for all the times that my mum used to see me and you know, there was a part of that that I used to, I used to enjoy seeing. I used to want my mum to see me like that because I used to blame my mum for so many things. And, and the truth is, you know, my mum wasn't responsible for me taking drugs. I was. Um, you know, there's, there's loads of, there's loads of things I did on drugs. And I'm not going to blame it and say, oh, it was the drugs. It, it was me. It was me. So what is the thing you miss most from your time as an addict? Um, I think that the most thing that I've missed, which is probably quite deep and philosophical, is the fact that I miss the time that I wasted. Um, I miss the time that I wasted waiting for drugs, ordering drugs, buying drugs, selling drugs, collecting drugs, dropping drugs off waiting for hours for people to meet me when I was really, really um, at death's door in my addiction. I, you know, all the arguments that I used to have with drug dealers, if I'd laid stuff on and not paid them back, or money I'd borrowed off friends and family to pay drug dealers, and all of the chaos and shit that addiction offers. Um, I don't miss any of that. But I do miss the time wasted doing all those things. If, you know, if it, there's one thing you can't ever get back is time. Um, and unfortunately, I've got loads of friends that have unfortunately lost their lives to addiction and they're completely out of time. Um, but that's the thing that I regret the most. Are you ashamed of your past? <laughs> um, it's a really good question. I used to be. Um, I used to be ashamed of my past when I first went into treatment, when I first went into rehab. And I used to think about all the damage that I did to my friends, my family, the community that I lived in, and also all the damage I did to myself and my loved ones, more importantly. Um, but now I like to think I've, I've turned that negative into a positive. I talk to thousands of people across the country and hopefully I can make a difference and more importantly challenge the stigma that surrounds addiction. So I use my past to, to be the person I am today. So can anyone become addicted if they try drugs. Um, yeah, of course. Anyone can go through pain and suffering and anybody can go through um, you know, dark and terrible times. Anybody can be affected through their mental health or the world around them. Um, and a lot of people will turn to drugs as a solution. You get a lot of people as well, which probably isn't talking about enough, is the fact that people do get addicted to all sorts of pharmaceutical drugs. So not all drug addicts you know, are out there taking crack or smack or ketamine. Um, and there's a lot of normal people that will take um, pharmaceutical drugs that are just equally as dangerous as the other drugs that I've just mentioned. Um, so anybody has the potential to, to be, become a drug addict. Um, and in the same respect, anybody has the potential to stop being a drug addict as well. Do you think there's a drug that's the most addictive? I don't personally think it's just one drug over the other. And if anything, the, probably the most common drug that's used every single day that I've seen used numerous times on my way here is alcohol. But no one ever talks about that because that's a legalised drug. We pay tax on it and it's not, you know, it's socially acceptable. If pubs sold crack, maybe that might be, <laughs> you know, maybe people might view it differently then, but, um, 
but yeah, alcohol would probably be the most common. How would you start a conversation with someone to tell them to think that they're addicted? Now that's probably the most difficult, but also simplest, um, or I'll probably, it's the most simplest thing that anybody can do, any human being can do to another, which is sit down and, and, and truly listen to them. Now, the problem is that unfortunately the addict may not always tell you what's going on. Um, they may tell you a degree, a certain amount, you know, or to a point. Um, but ultimately what we want, there's a, there's a famous quote that says the opposite of addiction is connection, uh, which is, I think is a guy called John Hari, an amazing guy um, that, that studies addiction and, and all the, the things linked to it. Um, and I think all we really want when I was an addict was to connect. Um, I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. I felt like I didn't belong in society, in the community that I was in, even in the world. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was even a part of my own family. Um, I didn't want to exist anymore. So for me, having someone sit down and say, you know, what, what the f is going on? Um, and not in a, you know, not in a brash or confrontational way, um, just saying it with love. Um, and for me, you know, if I wasn't asked that question, I, I wouldn't be here today. Um, so if you know someone, you know, sit them down, create a safe space. Don't shout it out in the streets in public or scream and shout at someone in a nightclub if they're f off their head. Have it in a safe and comfortable environment where you can sit that individual down or group and say, you know, do not think this is a problem. Um, ask them why they think they do it. They may not admit it straight away, but I think internally, it will get them sort of critically thinking about their lives and what they're doing. Um, and it starts as simple as asking someone if they're okay and genuinely meaning it. When you're in addiction, you are isolated. Mm. You're cutting yourself off from every relationship to any meaningful communications with people, any connection whatsoever. And then it's like, oh, I wonder why I'm drinking myself to death yeah. or using myself or doing whatever to death. And it's like, because what else have you got going on?